In today's video, I'm going to channel my inner Mike McCurry, and I'm going to turn this pile of lumber into a beautiful chessboard. The dark squares are made from Peruvian walnut and the light squares bird's eye maple. The frame is made from mahogany with a tiger maple inlay. Super fancy. Welcome back to the wood shop. My name's Brett. I've really been looking forward to this project, so let's get started. As with most woodworking projects, this one begins by making bigger chunks of wood into slightly smaller chunks of wood, and then getting them flat, square, and parallel on both sides. I've avoided using my benchtop joiner for a few years because when I did use it, I ended up turning my board from relatively straight into a canoe or a wedge. I thought I'd try it again for this project since so much depends on straight square edges for glue ups but I still suck at it. So I went back to jointing on my table saw. My new helical cutter head did a fantastic job on the figured cherry, curly maple, and mahogany. I made a video about replacing the cutter head on my DeWalt planer recently. There's a link in the description to that video if you're interested. Most of the boards I had were four quarter or one inch thick, and for the chest squares I only needed about three eighths of an inch. So I ripped down the Peruvian walnut and bird's eye maple to three inches wide so I could resaw them in half at the table saw and then plane them smooth again. I clamped these thinner boards together overnight to help prevent cupping and twisting. To get a better gluing edge, I swapped out my thin curved combination blade for a full curved ripping blade. And then I put a clean edge on the bird's eye maple on the walnut boards and then ripped each one to the final width of two and a half inches. This is my first time using tight bond extend. This stuff is like milk. It's very runny. I'm not sure it was necessary for this glue up. I probably could have gotten by with tight bond too. But one nice thing about the extend is that it dries clear instead of yellow. And it's a little easier to sand out.
This contraption is my veneer press. It's made from two phenolic cutting boards that are 18 by 24 and screwed to a double thickness of 3 quarter inch plywood. The cross members have a camber on them to put pressure in the middle where clamps can't reach. That way I can apply vertical pressure and horizontal pressure at the same time. I don't know why I was thinking I needed to use the crosscut sled to cut these strips instead of just using the fence. The miter bar gets a little wonky when it's 20 inches out from the front of the blade. A couple of my strips got a little skewed. Thankfully I made two boards, because hey, if I'm going to take the time to make one, I might as well make two, right? Best case scenario, I can cherry pick the best board, and then I'll have a second board that I can sell. But if something goes wrong with the first one, I have a backup. Here's another situation where there's a better way to do it. Brushing the glue on each strip was a little slow, and even though I was using Type Bond 3, which has a longer open time, the first couple of strips started getting pretty tacky before I was able to get the clamps on. I think I ended up using like five or six different kinds of glue in this project. Glue doesn't stick to the phenolic plastic boards, so I don't have to worry about them getting stuck to whatever I'm laminating. The clamping calls are wrapped in packing tape, so they won't stick either. The roller was much faster for applying glue, and if you rinse it out before it dries, you can use it over and over again. Don't know why I didn't start using this method sooner. After the glue was dry, I tightened up the edges by giving it just a little shave on the table saw. On the first chessboard I made a few years ago, the corners of the elevated playing field got a little rounded. So to prevent that from happening, I surrounded this one with some extra strips that were the same thickness so the edges wouldn't get over sanded. Not too shabby. Ok, 
Okay, I've run into an issue, or a couple of issues actually. The mahogany board that I was using, it was about 12 inches wide, I ripped it down into two and a half inch strips. It had a pretty significant twist to it, and I was hoping that ripping the two and a half inch pieces off of it would help with that twist. It did not. Um, some of the pieces ended up worse, and some were a little better, but overall the, the four pieces together, uh, it's not gonna match up real well. So yeah, this this one two and a half inch piece got a pretty significant twist. On this side is not as bad, but the fact that there's any is not good for a frame for something like this. So in order to get it flat again, I'd have to remove material either with the planer or the joiner, and that would make it even smaller. Issue number two is now that I've got this board laminated up on half inch MDF. Uh, I don't want MDF on the bottom of the board. That would be ugly. So I, want, I was gonna laminate it to this quarter inch plywood and then have the mahogany frame around it. Well, with the quarter inch plywood and the half inch MDF, that only leaves us, uh, it's not very much. Yeah, it's less than an eighth of an inch. My plan was to make a dado in the edge of the frame and tuck this stuff into it with an, only an inch of, of thickness before sanding. That's just not gonna work. So, so a big part of woodworking is hiding your mistakes. I don't know if I would call this a mistake per se, maybe a lack of foresight, because the mahogany that I was working with started off as four quarter or one inch thick and then a half inch substrate and a quarter inch uh, plywood bottom, that's three quarters, it already doesn't leave a lot of material to do a dado into the side of it. So I would have preferred to work with thicker material. I just didn't have that. So here's my new plan. I'm going to resaw the mahogany, maybe not exactly in half, but maybe three eighths of an inch once it's planed down and then I can laminate that to more substrate, either MDF or some plywood, and then that would take care of both problems of eliminating the twist by laminating and gluing and making it flat with my veneer press. So that'll take the twist out of it. It'll also make the frame pieces thicker so that I can cut a dado into the side and slide it over the core and the plywood bottom. So that's what I gotta do next is resaw the mahogany frame pieces. I ended up going with half inch plywood and cut that a little oversized and I used painter's tape to keep the top and bottom in alignment, which worked great. This veneer press is coming in really handy for this project. Let me know in the comments if you want me to make a video on how I made it. I'd be happy to do that if enough people are interested. Squeeze up. I thought it was the smoothest glue up I ever did.
Next, I resawed and played down the tiger maple that I'm going to use for the inlay and edge banding. Have you ever heard of paper stone? I hadn't either. On my first chessboard, I was thinking ebony for the inlay, but when I found out how expensive it is, the guy at my local hardware dealer showed me this chunk of paper stone. And it's a lot like it sounds. It's made out of paper fiber and some kind of adhesive. It's super dense and super flat and jet black. I only need a little bit, so I'm ripping down some thin strips and then ripping those down even thinner. I was lucky enough not to get any glue on the plywood edge, so I'm putting that side up against the fence first and then trimming off both edges. Then I'll add a rabbit for the inlay and a dado for the edge banding. Back to the milk, or maybe heavy cream. This time it was an excellent choice for the longer open time because there were a lot of pieces to put together. Hallelujah. 
lo ha sido todo Dios Aleluya I was careful to sneak up on the fit for these miters because cutting too short would be a disaster at this point. Right now, the more seasoned woodworker watching this is saying, maybe out loud, oh no, he's not going to use dowels to reinforce the miters, is he? Yep, I am. I'm using a self-centering dowel jig in a square to line everything up. What could go wrong? pretty tight. I better sand these down first. Too bad this one's glued in already. Well, I was right to be cautious and concerned about these dowels. Even though I had a guide and I was lining it up with a square and taking every precaution that I could, making sure everything was locked in and marked and level and straight and lined up, um, there's still just a little bit of play in that doweling jig and it's easy enough to get off on your angles a little bit and multiply that times eight. Um, it didn't go perfectly. Let me show you. <laughs> and unfortunately I got ahead of myself with, I don't know what I was thinking. I, I wasn't ready for glue up. I don't know how many times I dry fitted these miters without the dowels, without the holes even just to make sure that my lines were matching up and that my corners were matching up and everything was tight and ready to go before even drilling the holes. I did that multiple times off camera, of course, because you don't need to see necessarily all of that. But then once I drilled the holes, I'm like, yeah, I'm ready for glue up, but I hadn't dry fitted these yet. <laughs> and just, this is the first corner that I'm tested and Let's see how it goes together. Yeah, and it's not because the dowel's too long, but now my miter's not coming together. It's, you can't really see this, but you can feel it. You can maybe hear it that 
this is raised up, so I would have to sand a lot of that down. Alignment-wise, corner to corner, it's okay, but up and down, and what's hard to see on camera is that there's now a twist introduced into the joint that wasn't there before. And if you look on the back side, if I get the front as tight as I can, the back side opens up. And so that's, that's a problem. So I can't move forward with these dowels as is. So lesson learned there, don't use dowels on your miters because unless you have some way to make absolutely sure that they're, everything's, you know, lined up the way it ought to be. Perfect 90s and all that. So plan B is to scrap the dowels all together, but I can still use the holes that I drilled and I'll take these over to the router table and route out the oval between the two holes and then make floating tenons to fit in there instead. So that should work pretty well. It's just more time. This setup's a little janky, but it worked. For the frame glue up, I used Titebond Hide Glue, another first for me, which looks exactly like caramel ice cream topping. I didn't taste it though. You'd think this video is sponsored by Titebond or something. I'm out here in the cold and the snow to talk about the sponsor for today's video. I'm just kidding. I don't have any sponsors. Let's get back in the shop. It's cold out here. <sighs> Hide Glue has several advantages over PVA glue. First is the long open time, and you can make that even longer by warming up the glue, but not above 150 degrees Fahrenheit. The second is that as it cures, it will actually pull the joint together even tighter, which will help prevent against something called joint creep. PVA glue retains some elasticity when it cures, which can allow joints to creep with seasonal wood movement. And possibly one of the best features is that it's water soluble, so even after it's fully cured, even years later, if you don't like how things came together, you can wet it down with water and it'll release. So for that same reason, it's only good for indoor furniture. This stuff won't hold up in the weather. I worked my way up through the grits to 400, applying light pencil marks between each grit. 
When the pencil is gone, it's time to move up and grit. With everything flat and smooth, I added a tiny chamfer to the top and bottom edges and routed finger slots on the sides with a cold bit. Another first for me, using Odie's oil and wax finish. I was pleasantly surprised at how good this smells. There must be lemon oil in it because it has this lovely lemon fragrance that lingered in my shop for a couple of days. It's really easy to apply. You just swirl it in with a white non-woven pad, which is the equivalent of 600 grit or 4 aught steel wool, and then wipe off the excess after about 15 minutes. This really is the best part of a project. It's awesome to see that bird's eye maple come to life and the chatoyance of that tiger maple. That's my favorite woodworking term, chatoyance. Yeah, this board is actually going to be part of a bigger build. Um, I'm building a table out of curly cherry. It's going to have leather armrests for the players and drawers for the chessmen and notepads and a clock and stuff like that. I'm still working on it, but you can be sure that video will be coming out when I've finished with it. Hey, can you do me a favor? If you appreciate the work that I put into these videos, would you be willing to show your support? Well, there's a few ways you can do that. And I don't talk about this much. In fact, this is the first time I brought it up. And no pressure at all, but right below this video, next to the thumbs up and the share, there's three little dots. And if you click on that, it'll bring up a short menu. And one of those options is a little heart with a dollar sign in it, and it says thanks. And if you click on the thanks, it'll give you the option to give a donation the size of your choosing. It's just a one-time thanks. It's not a subscription or anything like that. It won't, it's not recurring. But that's just a way to say thanks for making these videos and taking the time. And like I said, no pressure, totally up to you. Another way to show your support is to go to my merch store, also below this video. And I've got seven new designs for shirts, hats, coffee mugs, other things like that. You can even get a shirt just like this one. Isn't it awesome? This is a Brett Miller original. And a third way you can show your support is by using my affiliate links in the description below this video. Most of them take you to Amazon, and I'll let you in on a little secret. It doesn't even matter if you buy the thing that you clicked on. Amazon tracks your clicks with cookies, and whenever you make a purchase, it could even be toothpaste. It doesn't even matter. Amazon will reward me with a small commission for your purchase. You could even buy cookies. Enough about that. It's your move. And I'll let you in on a little secret. What? Why did my light go out? Stop doing that. What is wrong with you? Uh. Oh my goodness.